Thanks. Uh, so, hey, yeah, as mentioned, I'm a data science consultant with uh, Slalom um, in Seattle here. So I've worked on um, a bunch of different projects with different clients and in different industries, um, from data science projects and geospatial analytics to NLP modeling. Um, but more recently, really in the past year, I've been focusing on uh, deploying models into production with MLOps. Um, and especially as this field, MLOps fields, uh, is evolving in, in data science, I wanted to give this intro talk and um, how do we even get started deploying and monitoring models with MLOps. So in this talk, we're going to um, first kind of go over what MLOps is um, and you know what uh, we can distill down some best practices in MLOps. Um, but since this is an intro talk, I want to kind of go over uh, the basics of MLOps, what processes it covers before just diving straight into deploying and monitoring um, models. So if you've ever spent a, a time on a project building and training models as a data scientist, uh, you know at some point, um, once you've landed on this well-performing model that's solving some kind of business need, uh, you need to maintain that in a regular um, way to keep uh, producing results, um, to keep continuing to score against it, to use it in production. Uh, we call this process after that exploratory and research phase of data science, uh, productionizing a model um, or putting a model into production. So the code you write here uh, to pre-process data, train, and score your model is just really one piece of that puzzle uh, to put that model into production. And that's really where MLOps comes um, comes into play. Uh, it doesn't just focus on the ML code necessary for you know, training, scoring, evaluating your model, but actually um, the whole ecosystem to run that model in production. So MLOps is really this uh, collection of best practices in order to put a model into production. Um, it stands for machine learning operations, and uh, it really pulls from these three different disciplines. Um, we have uh, machine learning, which is what most of us, uh, you know, women in data science would be familiar with. Um, the feature engineering, a, a part of that training, scoring, evaluating your models. Uh, data engineering handles really the ingesting of data in a reoccurring and reproducible way, uh, like using uh, data pipelines to schedule that data refresh for your, your new scoring and retraining data. And then there's DevOps that covers uh, versioning your code base, um, using continuous integration, continuous deployment practices or CICD practices um, in order to limit uh, a lot of these like manual processes um, that we might need to do to put a model into production and deploy it. Um, and DevOps really here improves um, our ability, ability to scale deploying and maintaining more and more models. So we apply these three disciplines uh, in each area of the ML lifecycle um, in order to make them more reproducible and automated. I'm going to kind of breeze through uh, the these four you know kind of areas of the ML lifecycle because uh, if you've you know if you're already interested in ML ops and putting something into production, you've probably probably already been through that research exploratory phase of you know collecting data through training a model um, in kind of a one-off notebook or script or series of, of notebooks. Um, so each of these uh, these steps that we covered at the ML lifecycle um, will need to be covered by MLOps processes. So kind of retooling those to work in a reproducible way. Um, for example, in production, we no longer want to handle uh, collecting data in flat files or uh, handling you know, hard-coded paths to flat files. Uh, for data data sourcing, um, when we're pre-processing and creating features for our model, um, you know we we may want to um, make sure that we're capturing objects needed um, after training and scoring. So, for instance, if you're using like a standard scaler uh, to fit your data to um, to uh, standard scale it, you want to be able to reuse that scaler object, you know, days weeks later in production um, when you need that for scoring. Um, and then in training, we also want to capture a lot of our metadata about the training session itself um, so that we can recreate that model again later. So for instance, like capturing the hyperparameter values that we've selected for a model. Um, and even the search space that uh, we search through might be useful for, um, you know, kind of tracking back the lineage of the model, but especially the hyperparameter values that um, we're using in order to recreate that model later. So we do this, uh, you know, we do all this that once our model deployed, it's it's no longer uh, 
fully manual process to, to, to cover um, the ML life cycle. So we want to apply ML ops to this ML life cycle and then include deployment and monitoring for production models. Um, so deployment really covers how we access our model uh, to use in, in you know, scoring inference um, processes. Uh, it can look like a real-time inference endpoint that is ingesting, accepting incoming um, streaming data. It can be a package model that's scored against a big batch of data, um, or it could even be a model deployed on an edge device, like at the it's scoring at the device um, it level itself and not cloud or, or local. Um, however, you know, once your model is deployed, um, you know, later we can talk about CICD practices here to in, improve reproducibility. So we'll go over kind of best practices on how to deploy models here soon. And then once our uh, model is deployed, um, we want to then monitor our model to be alerted when we detect significant changes. Um, of course, since this is a life cycle, um, once we've deployed our model, we'll be revisiting, collecting new data, um, and you know, retraining the model um, back at the top of the cycle. Uh, and this is where model monitoring can really help us signal to determine when to uh, restart that cycle over again. So how do we start to reproduce this life cycle in a more automated and reproducible way? Um, really moving away from these like monolithic notebook or no series of notebooks for each model that we want to um, put into production. Um, kind of like how do we stop you know, pushing our own cart, so to speak, and start building an engine to start moving it for us. So we're gonna take a look at the MLOps maturity curve because it lays out getting from that manual to automated coverage of this life cycle. So a couple of years ago, um, at the very beginning of 2020, pre-world starting to catch on fire, um, some folks at Google captured this idea of how teams um, moved from fully manual to all the way to fully automated deployment of models into production where level zero really involves just these very fully manual processes from collecting flat files to kicking off retraining and scoring um, from flat scripts um, being ran maybe from a notebook or you know uh, from someone's computer um, locally uh, and uh, where there was no real code versioning happening and we're not collecting a lot of metadata about um, the model itself so each time you you know train a model that's it. It'd be really hard to recreate if you uh, restarted the session later. Uh, level one involves starts involving um, pipelines, this concept of pipelines. Um, and this is really kind of the magic word for today. And if you take anything away from this session, it's, it's kind of that pipelines will allow your team to start automating and create uh, reproducible processes for deployment. Um, so at this level, we're mostly, we still are mostly kicking off um, the pipelines manually instead of triggering them. Um, but pipelines at this level are generally ML pipelines that cover that, you know, some process of the ML lifecycle. Maybe you have a retrain pipeline, scoring pipeline, uh, data about, you know, data ingestion and validation pipeline. Um, so we here we also start collecting um, necessary metadata from training in order to be able to recreate a model later on. Um, we also at this level want to start doing some automatic data and model validation. Um, in order to kind of catch issues early on. So level two, uh, this evolves into uh, automatically triggering our ML pipelines that we created in level one. Uh, it's moving more towards it's like full, more fully leveraging CICD practices from DevOps. Uh, for example, um, a example here would be, you know, you create a pull request um, on your dev branch on GitHub. Um, so you've you've like created your ML pipelines um, in order to uh, publish them or deploy them, and uh, you've opened a pull request in, in your dev branch. You uh, you get that approved, and then once that pull request is approved, um, you could set up something like GitHub Actions, uh, which will trigger uh, that deployment of your model as an endpoint into your dev environment. So it would actually pub would automatically publish your on pipelines into something like if you're using SageMaker or Azure ML or um, a uh, more open source option um, as an endpoint. Um, here in level two, you may also um, have a data drift monitor set up in place. And we'll talk about 
data drift a little bit later um, that kind of automatically uses that data drift monitor to kick off a retrain um, ML pipeline uh, whenever kind of a threshold is hit. So level two is really about, if level one is about creating ML pipelines, level two is about triggering them automatically. So let's kind of focus on this like level one and really understanding ML pipelines first for, for deployment. So ML pipelines are this way to chain specific steps together um, to perform certain actions, processes in the ML life cycle. Um, so for example, like you might have uh, one common process is a score, uh, scoring your model to get predictions. You need to get the right data set and the set of features you need, um, any scalar objects or uh, reusable objects you, you um, use during training to you know, transform that data. You then predict against your model um, and then land those predictions and the metadata about scoring into a storage um, you know, solution, maybe a, a data lake or blob storage or something, S3. Um, so that uh, downstream systems like reporting or the application that's using your predictions can pick them up. And pipelines really formalize this process so that it can be rerun multiple times with um, different uh, data inputs. So they allow you to kind of compose these steps that you need in order um, and then in order to, to recreate the ML life cycle. Um, and later on, when we're ready for level two, uh, we, we can even potentially kick off these ML pipelines automatically through a schedule or triggered event. So why, like, why even use uh, ML pipelines? And, you know, kind of if I've convinced you that of their usefulness, um, how do you get started using them? Um, it's, it's really, so uh, the folks um, that wrote the machine learning design patterns that is a, this little snippet here, um, have a have a great point because it's really um, the alternative is manually kicking off tracking notebook scripts um, and uh, you know maintaining each model um, that you want to and then trying to put that each one of those individually into production um, and then ensuring that each uh, of your teammates is trained on how to um, run those notebooks or scripts manually manually. And the problem uh, really is with having an individual kicking off everything end to end becomes really tricky at scale. Um, so like, especially if you have uh, more and more models to maintain, um, it's even a risk to kind of have one person uh, know how to run one model, um, but then another mo notebook might have a different way of kicking that off or um, changing inputs. Um, so then models and in, in production become kind of the siloed like not like knowledge walls of being able to kick them off and keep them going. Um, so pipelines really help force enforce those standards across models to enable us to move towards more um, you know automation so that you're just changing certain parameter inputs for them. Um, a couple like just a few examples of some common um, pipelines that are a good place to start. Uh, so how to start identifying what pipelines to create. Um, start looking at what reoccurring processes that your team tackles. Um, a lot of the common ones across uh, you know, any ML project is going to be data collection validation. Um, you know, you're gonna help probably have to retrain or fit a model or you know, create your clusters. Um, then you have kind of the model scoring or inference where you're getting you know, the predictions or, um, or labels out. Uh, these are kind of choice to turning into their own pipelines because they group uh, steps together that are generally ran together in the ML life cycle. Um, and just a quick note, there's some more information in the appendix here about, you know, like what tool, like do I code this by hand? Like I don't know how to code a pipeline. Um, there's starting to be a lot more and more um, great open source tools for this. Um, SK Learn has, I think, their own pipelines um, uh, class in their package. Um, Azure ML and AWS, both with SageMaker, have their own like cloud um, options for building pipelines. So there's a there's a slide in there that kind of goes through like making those tooling decisions and some um, considerations that your team um, might might think about uh, when choosing a certain tool. So uh, now we're kind of getting into um, you know best practices for uh, deployment uh, deployment of pipelines. So we're, you know, let's say we're creating a couple ML pipelines to train and then score. How do we ensure that we run these two pipelines, maybe days or weeks apart, um, and that they 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 work like when we run when every time we run them? 
Um, so one best practice here, uh, one, one best practice that ensures being able to run a pipeline over and over without environment issues specifically um, is uh, images. So uh, you've probably been in the case, um, at least with um, exploratory research of, you know, maybe um, sharing a notebook or a script with a, a colleague and then had issues installing or running certain packages in order to recreate that same environment for the code. Um, so in that case, you know, conda files generally work really well for that short period of time where you're just trying to kind of collaborate um, across like an ever changing um, code base. And um, we can just simply just install the necessary packages and even call the, you know, um, numpy equals, you know, 2.5, an exact version of a package. But there's inevitably going to be cases where eventually a conda, conda environment file will install a slightly different version of a package the next time you try to install it on a compute or an environment on a um, you know compute environment, um, and it's going to lead to a broken environment. So the solution here is really images. Uh, we can use images like those created with uh, Docker or Azure ML um, environments to create an image once, and then we can call that exact environment from our pipeline to ensure it's always using the same environment up until you know we we um, specifically refresh it and recreate the image. Uh, so another best practice here is um, being able to reproduce a model in the future. Um, we should be capturing and storing certain artifacts necessary for recreating that model and being able to recreate the input data set format between training and scoring. Um, so, for example, like we should be capturing uh, the version of data that we're using um, to train a model, the version of data uh, that uh, score batch um, was scored on, uh, the hyperparameters, making sure the hyperparameters are, um, you know, the same across your dev and prod environments, um, the order of the features, something as simple as the order of the features across like a training and scoring batch. If you're like one hot encoding features, you're doing that in a notebook. It's not even something you have to think about. But in a you know pipelines that are ran at different times and scheduled, it's um, essential. Um, and again, the scalar object kind of um, coming up as an example that uh, it needs to be used on the um, the scoring transformation data set just like it was used on training. So once you've kind of got your deployment process stable, um, then you want to consider starting to monitor both um, model performance and data drift. And uh, model performance is kind of like this automatically detect when your model's performance metrics are slipping. And data drift is really detecting when you get new data, um, you know, is it, has it shifted too far from uh, the, the data that you trained on or the past data that you, you've seen. So in model performance, uh, we want to track a model's performance metrics over time. And when a metric drops below a certain threshold, like an F1 score or some other metric, we want to trigger an alert to investigate if retraining is needed. Uh, you might also want to um, you know, consider monitoring business metrics here. So you know, maybe we want to look at the rate of how often your, my model is picking um, or producing positives versus negatives um, if it's a classification problem. And in level two of that MLOps maturity curve, we, we might get to the point where uh, we can use monitoring itself to actually automatically trigger a retrain um, pipeline. And so, uh, you know, like while model monitoring uh, for performance metrics is important, uh, it's kind of often like detecting the symptom and not like the actual ailment itself, um, the disease. Uh, so, you know, it's, we really want to kind of go upstream from a model uh, performance and look at how our data is changing over time. And this is called, um, this change in data is called data drift. Um, so one type of data drift that's important to monitor is how much our scoring data is drifting from the data we used in training. So if scoring data becomes too uh, different from your training data, uh, model performance can be in impacted, uh, which is actually what's happening in this chart here. Um, so we have, you know, a, a feature source channel where, you know, a lot of our click throughs uh, for an ad, let's say it's an ad, are from a paid search um, campaign. Um, but over time, that feature is slowly turning into uh, the source like paid on social media click throughs from like a paid social ad campaign. 
Um, and because this feature, the distribution of this feature is um, slowly shifting over time, um, we actually notice um, model performance starting to drop off over time. Um, so, you know, other causes of, of data drift can include, um, you know, upstream process changing. So it may not even be the problem uh, itself in the real world, but it could just be like a sensor is being replaced and that suddenly changes units from, you know, inches to centimeters. And we want to capture that with a data drift monitor. Um, there's also, a, you know, several different types of data drift um, that you might want to consider looking at. There's covariate drift. You'll hear covariate drift a lot in, in data drift monitors, and that's where we're looking at the relationship uh, between features or that kind of covariate shift. Um, it's it's kind of, um, you know, it, uh, within the feature itself, that was the example that we, we saw previously. Uh, there's also target variable drift where the distribution of features remains the same, but the distribution of the um, target variable changes over time. For example, that'd be like housing prices rising over time, where input features may be stable um, and the source isn't changing, but the actual target price is drifting higher. And then there's concept drift, which is um, kind of this uh, idea that um, something about the problem has changed. So it's the relationship between our features and the target variable over time. It can happen over time or suddenly. And so this chart here is an example of that where, you know, suddenly um, we have kind of weekly spikes where people are buying uh, loungewear on the weekends, but then suddenly we hit, you know, national lockdown pandemic um, and the actual uh, values are much uh, higher than our, our uh, predicted. So I know this was like a whirlwind intro to MLOps and like deployment and monitoring um, models. So I wanted to leave you guys with some um, resources that I found really useful. Um, the MLOps, uh, the machine learning design patterns book that I quoted earlier, um, specifically the pipeline workflow chapter is great to get like an intro and a little bit more details on pipelines. Um, and then for communities, if you guys want to ask questions, um, you know, play around with pipelines. What tools do I use? The MLOps community, um, they, they have a Slack channel as well as a great podcast that they put out. And then um, kind of the last thing is, is if you guys are, um, you know, kind of a team who's trying to get support for deploying models um, and you, you know, maybe you're experiencing some pushback from leadership to justify your case, um, Google has this uh, white paper AI, adopt AI adoption framework um, that has some good, um, you know, especially visuals to use and reuse in a deck, but some some good content for justifying that. So yeah, this is a um, bit of whirlwind, but I've left resources. And I think that the, uh, the slide deck will be available in the session. Um, and um, yeah, we can head into questions.